All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. And let's um, let's go ahead and pray again and just get transitioned again back to uh, back to the message. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you, Jesus, for this time to come here and just be in fellowship, be in community, be in worship, and be in your word. Go before us now into this time, and um, just go before me also, or my mouth and my heart, my mind, as um, we just move through these chapters. And I thank you for the power of your word that's alive and really does reach down inside of our hearts. <coughs> just thank you right now for our time together in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 All right. All right, so thank you, technology. So here we are. We are in chapter um, six, and um, if you followed any of the videos, you know it's just an emotional conclusion. It wraps up with this amazing man, Stephen, dying, and I got it just it was emotional just to, to go through it, but powerful and challenging and encouraging and eye-opening in so many ways. And as we've seen moving up into this chapter here, the devil is trying to destroy the church. He's trying to destroy it um, by persecution from within and problems from within. He's trying to bring in deception and lies. And now he's actually moving forward. We've got these little seeds of dissension that are sown inside the church. So open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. And um, we're going to cover, all, like we always do, the whole thing. I'm not going to go through all of Stephen's sermon um, details, which is... It's such a great way to get an overview of the, of the patriarchs in the Old Testament and just review all of that and, and get a handle on it. Those of you who grew up in the church are like, I remember that story. And some of you who didn't grow up in the church go, oh, that makes sense now. Like you see the people and the, the names coming together. So I hope that was a blessing to you like it was to me. So opening up in verse 6, uh, we have now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews uh, because um, their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. You know, I always find it interesting, the firsts that are in the Bible. First, as I'm going through and I'm doing word studies or getting ready to do a Bible study, I notice things like, what's the first time that occurred? And then what's the second or third? Is there a pattern? And what's the last time that's ever mentioned? I, I notice things like that. And I hope you're on the lookout for those as you go through. I'm going to have you do quite a few of those um, in this upcoming lesson that you're going to be doing. But this is the very first time the word disciple is ever used. The very first time it's ever used in the book of Acts. Um, it's even more important that um, Luke uses the word mathetes, which is where we get our word mathematics actually from it. So don't have too many trigger warnings on that one, but um, mm -hmm. I needed one. Um, but it actually refers to believers. It first refers to followers of Christ. In fact, it's the most common name given um, to followers of Christ in the book of Acts is disciples. And it's never mentioned again after the book of Acts. None of the epistles ever <coughs> talk about disciples. Interesting. You know. So notice things like that as you're reading. Things that are first and things that are last and things that are never said again. And I... As I was doing my word study and nothing came up, the epistles, I'm like, I, I looked it up wrong. I started, I'm like, literally the word disciples is not in not one single Seriously? epistle. 100% positive. I dribbled, I quadruple actually, checked it. I, I guess she don't fact check me on Google. <laughs> so this is the first verses. This is the first verses. It's the first verses. And not the first verses, the first verses. The first us versus them. Mm. The haves and the haven't been getting any. <laughs> the left out is the Hellenists versus the Hebrews, the Greek speaking Jews and the Hebrew or the Aramaic speaking, the native Jews. And what's going on? Well, be sure to know that there are mean spirited, deliberate, high handed, intentional behaviors that are divisive. And we saw that with Ananias and Sapphira, didn't we? On purpose. Flat out, mean spirited, intentional, and they were confronted, weren't they? <laughs> it's a really polite way to put it. They dropped dead for their life in front of everybody, and they're escorted out. And so we're thankful that God isn't doing that in the church today, at least not lately. But there's grumbling and there's complaining that's going on in the church now. Is God going to strike down these complainers? I mean, He's done that before, He's struck down complainers before. All right, he takes complaining really seriously. Do a word study on that. Grumbling, complaining comes up a lot, and God's not happy about it. All right, he uh, says in in Numbers, 
that when they were complaining, the sons of Korah, they started this re- uh, rebellion, and they're whining and complaining against Moses, and they take it pretty far, and they try to get all the people together, 150-ish men or whatever, and the ground splits open and swallows them, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with their households and all the men with Korah and all their goods. So they and those with them went down alive into the pits. The earth closed over them, and they perished from them on the assembly for complaining, <coughs> for bitterness, for stirring up trouble. They're complaining. So complaining is serious. Don't take it lightly if you're not bringing up a legitimate issue. In fact, the word complaint, the word, do I have it on? Did I not put it up there? Anyway. The word complaint um, is from the Greek word, uh, really fun to say. It's um, gogusmos. Can you say that? Gogusmos. Or, or goguzo. And it's an onomatopoetic word. In other words, the word sounds like it is said and it, and it, it is done. Um, and so it's this dissatisfaction, a grumbling, and a murmuring. It describes um, from the lexicon great. Secret grumblings that buzz away until they're heard. The gusmos means whispering and emphasizes a smoldering discontent, which if not handled can easily flame up and produce a split in a church. What was happening in the church was an undercurrent of constant secret whispering that finally grew loud enough for the apostles to become aware of the problem and they nip it in the bud. What's the issue? The widows in the Hellenist group are being neglected. God's word is really clear on that point. Don't play favorites and don't neglect widows. And he means business when that. He calls people out all throughout the scriptures. So the fact that the Hellenists felt like um, both that is happening is a big deal. So this isn't just a minor little, I didn't get my way, you know, moment. This is serious and they, they bring it forward. And the New Living Translation says it like this, their widows were being discriminated against. The point is that unless the church took care of them, they wouldn't be taken care of. Not in that society, not in that time. And notice that the murmuring arose not from among the widows, but from the others because of their needs. Were they intentionally being overlooked because they were Hellenistic or Greek-speaking widows? The Bible doesn't actually say. The community was growing. It's growing a lot faster than they had time to put the systems in place to manage it. So the widows just slipped through the cracks. Church is growing really fast. And they had a real problem, and they it makes it clear because of the way the word is used, they kind of go about it the wrong way at first. They're grumbling and complaining, and they're murmuring. It's like a leaky faucet that goes along long enough it's going to end up with a big problem. Any murmuring that happens in the church has to be dealt with. So the Hellenists are not an error because of the issue. Their concern for the widows is right. But they are approaching error because of the way they're <coughs> handling it. They're murmuring on who steps up. The twelfth. And that's significant because they're listening. They're not so busy with the Lord's work that they don't even notice. They are there. They're listening. They're in. They're amongst the people, right? So they hear the issue. They realize the issue. And they get in. And they get involved. And they listen. And they get the complainers involved in the solution. It's perfect. And the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. But we'll devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And notice what they say, ministry of the word. The word translated ministry is from this Greek word, diakonia. And he uses it in Acts 6, 1 to describe serving the food, the daily distribution. That was the serving of the food. It's the same word. Luke's got his cool little wordplay going on here. (laughs) All right. And Acts 6, 4, he describes serving of the word of God. Literal bread is necessary for physical life. Spiritual bread is necessary for spiritual life. It's this great wordplay that Luke goes into. Well, that's also how we get the word deacon. Mm-hmm. Same word. And what are the deacons but the ones that feed the church who look after the feeding, the practical, literal feeding of the flock, making sure their physical needs are being met. This is where we started. The first deacons, they serve bread, lowercase b. So the <laughs> apostles could serve bread, uppercase b. The word of God, right? And everyone gets fed. And I love it. And so did they. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And, uh, and they chose Stephen. I'm going to highlight Stephen there. We only, get two, we only get information more about two guys in this whole list. Not that they weren't all influential. I'm sure they all were. But only Stephen. And then later we'll hear about Philip. Stephen, 
And we get this wonderful little phrase about him, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Pumba, I mean Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas <laughs> and uh, the proselyte. Of, I always, every time I read that, I'm like, did you get that name from that? The Bible is rich with really great character names you can use, like... Eglon and things like that. <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, they were set before the apostles. They prayed and laid their hands on them. And so it begins. And these seven men get things going. And they get them back on track. So that why? So the word of God can continue to increase. Their multitude is continuing to increase. The word of God continues to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And I love that Luke includes that part too there. That should always be our focus. What is going on in the church, in our lives, is keeping the gospel from going out. Is it sin in the camp, like Ananias and Sapphira? Is it blatant, selfish, sneaky pursuits, like they were guilty of? Stop it. Call it out. Confront it. Get on top of it. Kill it. It's cancer. Is it glitches in the practical ways that things are being done? Pause. Get that dealt with, too. Because if it keeps the word from going out, it's got to get fixed. Go to the meetings, meet with the leaders, make it happen. Don't be afraid of being that person. Don't be a brat. Don't be obnoxious. Don't be ornery. Have a pure heart. Have a biblical centered mindset, but get it taken care of so the cancer doesn't grow in the church. Just make sure you're motivated by love, love of God, love of your brothers and sisters, love of the gospel, and that your concern is in check with this issue. Otherwise, it's just petty personal preference. Know the difference. And here's a really important point. They didn't just elect any old leaders. You know, it's just handing out food. It was just a daily distribution. Anyone can do that, right? Well, apparently not. Look at the type of people that are the ones entrusted with getting this back on track. And I deliberately pulled verse 3 out of this so we can focus on it here. Pick out men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty of distributing bread, of handing out food, Hold, we want these types of people in charge of that mundane, basically serving tables, wait staff. And you might think it's a pretty overqualified group to be on this little 3D patrol, the uh, <laughs> daily distribution duty. I might think that too, but that's not what God thinks. Pick men who have a good reputation, who have the spirit, men are wise. That's who deacons need to be. All right. Now, in this case, these all happen to be men, but later on in the New Testament, we see that deacons are also women. Just choose wise and choose wisely. So we should be mindful of this as we, as a church, wherever you attend, some of you attend here, some of you attend elsewhere. As you're electing deacons and elders to your church, be mindful of that. It's not just, oh, just handing out bread, anybody can do that. Oh, it's not just taking care of the church facilities, anyone can do that. Wise, people of good repute, full of the spirit. So that's what they do. They pick these wise men, they pray, and they get things going. And the breakdown of the church from within is the church is a real thing. It might look like it started by a person, but I assure you, a breakdown in the church is demonic. It's demonic. Anything that divides is not from heaven. It's from the pit of hell. We talked about that in our last lesson. God adds. God subtracts. He did with Ananias and Sapphira. God multiplies. But like me, he doesn't divide. I don't do that either. It's like I get out of the calculator, try to figure it out. <laughs> Satan divides. And the church deals with this internal issue, but what comes next is another attack, and it's attack from the outside. And Stephen. Stephen's name means victor's crown. Appropriate. Because that's what he's going to be receiving, isn't it? And remember him? He's one of the seven that was chosen to help with this triple D issue. His name, again, is Victor's crown, and he's not afraid to go from serving up food to serving up truth, and he does it to the amazement and blessing and to the fury of others. Stephen is full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people, but not everyone's thrilled, are they? And that's also an important truth to remember, actually. Stephen served bread as well as bread. Just like the apostles, he was a servant, and that's what any of us should be. Ready to serve. There's no skill necessary there. Just show up. Be there. Do it. Pick a chair. Pick up a trash. Pick up a communion cup. Hand out the bread. We actually literally have bread that we hand out, which is awesome on our Sundays here. I love that. 
but also be ready to serve bread, capital B, God's word. And Stephen was ready and willing and clearly skilled. He knew what he was talking about, and he lived what he t- was talking about. He was full of grace. That's the Greek word charis, and it means favor and, pa- and power. That's the Greek word dunamis, and it means power, especially miraculous power, and it also means effective power. In other words, he was effective in what he did, not just in the actions of doing wonders and signs, but in the results. People came to God because of it. Well, some people did, obviously, not all. And there's a misconception that I see in the church, a false dichotomy or a false split. It's when Christians think that you either have to be gracious or powerful. They're not mutually exclusive. And right here, I hope you'll see that you can be both. Stephen was both full of grace and full of power. It was a dynamic duo. There's some more Ds for you. But that didn't always get along well with everyone else. That didn't move forward in the way that maybe you would think, gosh, he's so graceful and he's so powerful. Clearly, everyone (coughs) is falling at his feet, getting it done and enjoying what he has to say. So verse 9, it says, Some of them who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, Alexandrians, those who of Cilicia, Asia, rose up and disputed. Suzetio with Stephen. That's another fun word to say. That word disputed is from the Greek, and it means coming together to get to the bottom of something. Coming together and getting to the bottom of something. You might say debate or argue even in your translation, in your Bible, depending on what translation And those words have kind of taken on a negative connotation today. Thanks social media for that. But it's not outside the realm of social media. Um, It's anytime people bring things together. Um, But this wasn't that. This wasn't negative. There's no negative connotation in the original Greek in this particular word choice of Luke's at all. It simply and literally means (coughs) seek together. Suze. We get our word seek from it. Okay? And it's the present participle and it's active meaning that it was happening right then and it was ongoing disputing right he was multitasking because it meant he was ongoing with his daily distribution he really was all the d's daily distribution dynamic duo deacon disputer (laughs) all of them i could just do a whole sermon with the d word there all right he's quite a guy he's a waiter he's a debater and i want to point out that there's another misconception that i see in the church that we should be uninvolved and disputes It's just biblically inaccurate to say that. Divisions, no. (coughs) Quarreling, no. Disputes, yeah. It's in the Bible. All right? It's brought up multiple times, and it's always in the context of bringing someone, digging in together on an issue with someone and bringing them to Christ. Disputes are part of bringing people together. They only divide when people take their eyes off God and start seeking their own agendas instead of God's. So don't be afraid of disputes. Stephen wasn't. Don't be afraid of digging in with someone to get to the bottom of an issue, especially when it's a kingdom issue or it impacts the kingdom. When the issue revolves around God's intent for man, his purpose, his origin, his meaning, his destiny, speak truth, dispute if necessary, and still be full of grace like Stephen was, full of wisdom and charity and power. But don't dismiss disputing because you think it's not biblical. Stephen would disagree with that characterization. Stephen clearly has the gospel in mind because we already know he was deemed to be a man of good repute. Not only that, but he was skilled in disputing. Skilled in it. Why? We know that. Because they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And that word withstand is where we get our word antihistamine. Stand (laughs) against. That's what that word is. You like to think that if you just say things the perfect way that surely people will come around. I, I really tried my best, you think. You check your motives. You're sure your heart is right. You pray. You study. You share. You try your best. You dispute. You work through it together. You even come out after a dispute with others that are unable to withstand your points. You won, technically, right? But instead of coming around, they dig in and they get dirty. I know, more D words. I was on a roll at this point. <laughs> The word translated in your Bible was stand or resist, but he was saying the Greek word antihistamine, and it literally means to stand against. Anti, against, histemi, stand. They couldn't stand against what he was saying. They couldn't handle the truth. (laughs) Some translations might say cope. They couldn't deal with it. They couldn't cope with it. They, They could no longer dispute with him on it. There was no coming together with that. They couldn't deal with what he was saying. Just because you're a good person, just because you're a person of good reputation, 
Just because you're a person that's full of faith and even full of the Holy Spirit, just because you're serving well, you're teaching well, you're even full of grace and power like Stephen, none of that is a guarantee that people will hear the truth. So I want to dispel another misconception. It's not about you being or saying or doing things just right so that someone else will get the message. It's trite to say this, but it's true. (coughs) Do your best and let God do the rest. It just doesn't mean that it's going to be all clean and beautiful at the end. It's often messy and ugly, and honestly, you may never, ever, ever, on this side of heaven, see the people that you care about come around. Don't let that stop you. It didn't stop Stephen. Look what happens next. Instead of saying, well, you've really made some great points there, Stephen. Sign me up. I want what you have. Oh, there's some water. Let's go get baptized. They did the 33 AD version of trolling and unfriending. And the literal translation is actually close to our idea of throwing someone under the bus. They secretly instigated, secretly instigated the word hoopabalo. And it means to throw under. They threw him under the bus or chariot or whatever. They, (laughs) They got men to lie about him. They didn't come around at all. They got worse about the whole situation. They brought in Moses and the temple and the law and God Almighty to ensure their accusations would really stick. And they threw in Jesus for good measure because they knew that would really tick the religious leaders off. Men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And did you catch that? They're so twisted in their fury that they put Moses before God. See the word order there? Word order counts in Greek, by the way. Important. They put Moses and the law above God. They didn't listen to Stephen's argument. They don't see that the law has been nailed to the cross as Paul wrote the council of debt, which listed all the rules we failed to follow. We took away that record of its rules and nailed it to the cross. Instead of Stephen's words stirring them to truth, they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him and they seized him and they brought him before the council and they set up false witnesses. Here's a picture of the council chambers uh, likely looked like, and this would have been a Sanhedrin. 35 people on one side, 35 people on another. It was said that they all, it was arranged in such a way that everyone could always see everyone's faces. That's a key point because Luke makes the point later that they were gazing intently at his face. We get that point in just a minute, but that's a, a good visualization of what that area looked like. So this isn't just street rumbling. He, they bring him before the council means this, they brought him in. And they're all around him now. These people and then some. Trust me, and Saul is there in this midst as well. And we'll get to that later. So this is the third time that the council sits in judgment now on the disciples, isn't it? First Peter and John, and then all the twelve, and now Stephen by himself. And each time the intensity of their persecution increasing, it goes from warnings to floggings, and of course we know finally stoning. And these are the accusations against Stephen. (coughs) Significantly, many of the same false accusations were leveled against Jesus. It's a good thing to be accused of the same things that Jesus was accused of, isn't it? They accused him of things because Stephen (coughs) clearly taught that Jesus was greater than Moses. That's blasphemous words against Moses. Jesus was God. Blasphemous words against God. Jesus was greater than the temple. That's blaspheming against the holy place. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. That's blaspheming against the words, the law. Jesus was greater than their religious customs and traditions. Jesus of Nazareth said he would destroy this place and change the customs. They threw that out there. Of course, Stephen never taught against Moses and God. That his glorification of Jesus was twisted by them, wasn't it? Stephen never spoke anything blasphemous against the temple, against anyone. He wouldn't make an idol out of the temple like the leaders did. Stephen had his words twisted and false accusations ended up being brought against him. But first they look at Stephen and what do they see? And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And I love the way I, I wanted, I wish these were my words. I just, I'm just going to quote it for you. It's so beautifully written the way it says this here. I wish I could have a photograph or picture of Stephen standing before the council, listening to all those false accusations and noticing the expressions of rage, ridicule, indignation on the faces of his accusers. Yet he stood there looking at them with a radiant countenance full of love, trust, peace, and confidence, undisturbed by all the bitter things that were being said. His heart was not filled with malice because of their hatred toward him, but joy in the realization that he was there as Christ's faithful servant. Wow. That should be our goal. Right? 
To speak the truth in love, that kind of love, true love, brightens our faces. There won't be a hint of any kind of smug triumph and knowing we're right. Paul said, you are all living in a crooked and mean world full of mean people all around you, among whom you shine like stars in the dark world. You offer the teaching that gives life. And Jesus commands us to let our light shine before men in such a way. And uh, back there. There we go. In such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So, above the fury of the accusations and the loud cries against him, we hear the voice of the high priest ask, Are these things so? Are these things so? And for the next 20 minutes, <laughs> I kind of timed it. I, I went through and I read it really slow and dramatically, like Stephen might have done it. And I was like, yeah, It's about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, Maybe Greek takes longer to speak, but it wasn't that long. So for 20 minutes, Stephen delivers a history lesson, but so much more, doesn't he? Right? Using scripture, he actually refutes every single accusation. And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham, that's the patriarch, so he refutes the charge of blaspheming God. Moses and the law, he speaks on from Acts, in Acts 7, uh, 17 to 43. This is a response to the charge of blaspheming Moses and speaking against the law. And then he speaks about the tabernacle and the temple in response to him speaking against the temple. Every single point that he makes through his speech, his sermon, his connecting feature of the four is that none of them was God's presence limited to a particular place. If you go back through and reread his message, take note of how God met with people. How God went with people. How God charged people to go. Right? The God of the Old Testament was a living God. A God on the move, on the march, who's always calling his people out for adventures. And and parties, actually. Because the entire Hebrew calendar is is oriented around parties and, and, and celebrations. It's pretty awesome. I still wish we were doing more of it. Anyway. So Stephen emphasized some things in Jewish history that... They may not have even considered that God would never confine himself to one place like the temple, that the Jewish people had a habit of rejecting the ones that God would send. Stephen's sermon does these three things. It was an answer to the accusations that was brought against him. He knows the word of God, and I love that. Think about it this way, guys. Listen, he had just become a Christian. He's just become a Christian, right? A follower of Christ. But he was raised, obviously... As a, a Greek-speaking Jew, he's a Hellenist. He's part of that group that gets called out. And he knows the word. So he's, what, three months, two months in maybe being a Christian? And he just lets it go. But he's not, this isn't all new stuff that he's heard from the apostles necessarily. This is all history. So he knew the word. He knew the Old Testament. How exciting and a good reminder for us to do the same. He shows that he accepts Moses as a prophet, that even his preaching of Jesus as the Messiah was just a proclamation that Moses himself had made. Woven into that history is his story, right? His sermon was proof that Jesus was the Messiah. The history was a mirror, a mirror for the religious leaders to hold up. And they're doing to Jesus just what all of the rebellious Israelites had done. So... The rulers are now rejecting Jesus. They betrayed him. They murdered him. But still, God would make him their deliverer. And he would bring the messianic kingdom that they had hoped for. So God delivered Joseph. He's now delivering Christ. And Stephen's history review, it culminates in calling them now out for idolatry. They worship the law. And they worship the temple. And they do to this day. They do to this day, not the reform, but the Orthodox Jews do. Instead of the lawgiver, they worship the law. Instead of the creator, they worship the creation. And that was our memory verse, Stephen quoting from Isaiah 66. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What kind of house are you built for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? And not my hand make all these things. They're guilty of, guilty of worshiping a building. Their traditions, their law, and holding so tightly onto that. Their hands are clasped around that. They can't release and reach out to Jesus. And that temple was never designed to be permanent. It always pointed to Jesus. And the temple in particular points to the coming kingdom of God. To the Sanhedrin and most of the Jews, the temple had become something like a lucky charm. 
They assumed that they had a lock on God, thinking we've got God on our side because we've got the temple. And sadly, they thought of him as their possession. So instead of God possessing them, they possessed God, or so they thought. As Stephen's quote from this passage from Isaiah 66 reminds us of the interchange between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Do you remember that story? Who believed that God could only be worshipped in a given place. Even the Samaritans believed that they would worship God in a specific place on a specific mountain. They had their mountain. But what did Jesus tell her? Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Did I skip it? Mm-hmm. There we go. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Stephen confronted their idolatry of the temple. They tried to confine God within the temple. God's too big to fit in any temple. You know that. And like Jesus taught the Samaritan woman, we don't have a place we worship in person. We worship Jesus, the person. So Stephen warmed up, fired up rounds the corner at the end of his sermon. And I love this. It's so typical of a good church sermon to wrap up the call to action. But also not to be... Too scary. Be careful. Don't be too pointed. Don't make people feel too badly. Just enough conviction to get an amen, but not enough to get, hey man, but not Stephen. He starts easy with his history lesson and he finishes schooling them all. Stephen the accused is now the accuser. He says, You stiff necked people. <laughs> that word stiff necked. Stiff neck is a Greek word, um, sclerotrichulos. Hmm. Neck, trachea, neck. You heard that there? And sclera, mm-hmm. maybe you know or heard of scleroderma? Mm-hmm. Ardeny, all right? The Jews are unable to turn their heads to see a different point of view. Stiff neck, right? It means literally hard or stiff neck, and it's used figuratively against, in, in <coughs> regards to a resistance to changing someone's behavior. And he says that they are uncircumcised, in hearts and ears, and you always resist. Now, uncircumcised, that really would have nailed them. Yeah. Jewish boys are circumcised on the eighth day. It's a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham, but God isn't interested in outward signs. He never was. He always wanted their hearts. And this isn't a new accusation, uncircumcised in hearts. God called him out in the Old Testament for that as well. Uncircumcised in hearts. This also occurs in the Old Testament. They're unwilling to turn because they were repeatedly un able to turn. They're unable to turn because they're unwilling. So their neck just becomes hard. You always resist the Holy Spirit, he says. It seems like they were convinced of the truth of what Stephen was telling them, but they wouldn't yield their hearts. Have you ever known someone like that? Like, have you ever talked to a kid? <laughs> and you know that they know that they're wrong. <laughs> they will not give in. They will die for their cause. That's how Jonathan was. No sticker charts. The iron will. No way. It's like, oh, I will die. One time I told him, we're not going to go to Disneyland with our pass if you don't, blah, 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 whatever it was. He's like, okay. (gasps) I'm like, well, no, I can't go to Disneyland. Darn it. I had to rethink my strategy. So the next time it was, okay, well, um, you're not going to play at Play Place after Mops. You know, we were being a stinker and we were at Mops and afterwards all the moms would go to the play place. And he's like, okay. Like that to me. I'm like, really? Hmm. So we went to the <coughs> McDonald's and to the play place. And I sat and chatted with my mom, my mom friends. And he sat next to me. I can't play. No, I don't want to punish myself. So I started rising up to Jonathan's ways. But he would dig, he would dig in and resist the Holy Spirit. And he's, he turned out okay. He's not an ax murderer now, but he's great. <laughs> so that's just, that was my bar. So apparently we made it. That's my bar. Right? <laughs> <laughs> said it really low. He says, your fathers, he goes on, he says, your fathers killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And now when they heard these things, they were (coughs) enraged. They were enraged. Stephen accuses them of betraying and murdering their Messiah, not keeping the law. Of course, had they accepted Jesus as their Messiah, they would have received the grace that he kept the law on their behalf. 
but they are so beyond done at this point. It's an interesting note. That word translated enraged is diaprio. I don't think I wrote that onto your notes there, but it's diaprio. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, thank you. See, it's so helpful to have you there. All right. (laughs) (laughs) And it means literally a heart that is sawn open. Okay. So Stephen had just said their hearts were not cut. Hearts weren't circumcised, but they're enraged, which means their hearts are ripped open. So it's like this another loop play on words that he's doing right there. You got uncircumcised hearts like you were supposed to have, but you're enraged, so you're just ripping your own heart open, right? Okay. What does the word of God say? That's exactly what the word of God does. The word of God cuts to our heart. It cuts to the quick. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword of piercing through the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And that's exactly what the word of God is doing to their hearts in front of their face, completely living out this passage in Hebrews. And Stephen looks up, still filled as he was described back when we first met him, still filled with the Holy Spirit. And they ground their teeth at him. That's another great little visual there, which is a figure of speech that comes from an idiom in the Greek that means that they were snarling like wild animals. Hmm. It's very emotional. It's very dramatic. It's very physical. They are up. They're not in that little room. They're all sitting all nice in their robes, staring at him anymore. They're like grinding their teeth, growling. They're, they can't even get the words out. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and gives us words for our grumblings, right? They don't, there's no words for this. They're not in the Spirit at all. They're just grumbling and growling and just gnashing. wanted to gnashing and ripping him apart. But Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And what does he see? The Son of Man standing <coughs> at the right hand of God. You know, 13 times. Christ is spoken of in scripture as seated at the right hand of God. Only once is he ever spoken of standing. And that one time is here. And that does it. Stephen says, son of man. Well, that's the ultimate messianic title. Jesus is the one who was given dominion and glory and the kingdom. And when Jesus used this phrase, he was assigning the son of man prophecy to himself. And he did it must have been like a knife turning in the stomach of the Sanhedrin. And especially the high priest Caiaphas. Why? Because at Jesus' trial, that illegal trial, when Jesus stood before Caiaphas, there was an interchange that surely Caiaphas would have remembered. It's only been a couple of months since it happened. And here we have again Caiaphas. And in that passage it says, Jesus kept silent, and the high priest Caiaphas mm-hmm. said to him, I adjure you, it means to act as under oath or put under oath, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on clouds of heaven. So Jesus answered that he's the Messiah and Caiaphas would have, would see him someday in the future. And what's fascinating is that when Caiaphas does see him, he'll be seated, not standing as he was for, for Stephen. Caiaphas will be judged by Jesus. And while Luke doesn't say there's no indication that Caiaphas or any of the other members of the Sanhedrin saw what, what Stephen was seeing at the time, but it was the final straw for the Sanhedrin. They're, they're done. They've lost it. They're outraged that Stephen would testify about the one whom they had murdered, telling them now that he's actually alive. Too much. And Luke records their fury, but he also includes a detail. It's so beautiful. The witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. It's like this fury he's describing and this, the snarling and the gnashing of the teeth and the, the reference to the, the Jesus and uh, <coughs> thinking about Caiaphas and everything that's happening, super visual and visceral. The witnesses lay their garments down at the feet of a young man named Saul, just a slip in there because in another few words, he's going to shift gears to this next chapter coming up. We're going to hear all about Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, 
They are stoning. It, the, the words are, as they are stoning him actually is the idea of remember that scene in Elf where he's like hurling all the. <laughs> that's the that's that word. When I read the actual definition, I'm like, that's what that word is like. Like swirling arms, just like pelleting him with all these stones. All right. So right in the middle of all of that. Stephen was calling upon Jesus. That word there, called out, is a, a word that means like <coughs> prayer. It's a sense of prayer. All right? And he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That means to be receptive. That word receive means to be receptive to someone, to welcome, to accept, to be a, take a favorable attitude towards something. Stephen is basically saying, Jesus, I'm coming, I'm coming home. Put out the welcome mat. <coughs> Beautiful picture. Stephen's work recalls his Lord's similar, uh, Stephen's word recalls Jesus' words. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And listen to this. And falling to his knees. What does that mean, ladies? What has he been doing this entire time? Standing. Standing. While being stoned, he was standing. That's supernatural power and grace. Literally placing his knees on the ground. That's what that word means. Falling to his knees means he, he was del- it was a deliberate placing of his knees on the ground, which means he must have been standing. Think of this. Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen knelt before him in worship and called on him in prayer. And he cried out with a loud voice, This is ridiculous. I don't deserve this. That's a loose translation of the Greek? No? (laughs) Really loose. Maybe it's in the message like that. Just kidding. No. Did he deserve it? No. (laughs) Was it completely unjust? Absolutely. Do those men deserve to be condemned to hell for what they did? Absolutely. But what does he say? Lord, don't hold this in against them. Earlier when it was said that he was full of power and grace, that's what this is. That's power. That's grace. Mm -hmm. To be so severely wrong, to be publicly wrong, to be beaten, literally beaten with rocks, not just people throwing bad words at him. And his final words are for mercy and forgiveness. And his prayer was answered, wasn't it? Because Saul would be forgiven and completely transformed after this. In fact, in our next lesson, it opens right up with the scene of Saul approving this execution. And it says, as it concludes, and when he said this, he fell asleep. So beautiful, he fell asleep. So peaceful in the midst of the wild fury of the mob, Stephen passes from this world to the next. And we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that is exactly where Stephen was. Present with the Lord. Jesus' arms open, now wrapped around Stephen. And he hears the words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Being martyred did not destroy Stephen's life. He did more by dying than he possibly could have done if he had lived for years preaching Christ. This is Stephen's legacy. This is our call as well to follow in his footsteps. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the testimony of Stephen, for the power of your word. For the reminder and the call to live to this high calling. To be women of grace and power because we are indwelt by your Holy Spirit and we thank you for that. And Lord, for everyone here today that has that ache in their heart because they have a loved one who continues to reject you. God, give us the kind of grace and power that Stephen had to speak truth. To speak it in love and to speak, give us the kind of grace and the power we need to engage with each other well. To come together to work through issues like we saw in the church and to do it to your glory, not our own. God bless our fellowship here as we move forward into this coming lesson. Help us to, to understand, to live out the words that you are teaching us. Bless us now as we leave, as we go back and And do a regular day and the things that we have on our plate, that we would do all of those things to your glory. And we ask now all of these things in your name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen.